This is my Bible. It is the Word of God, and it is the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am, seated right now in Christ Jesus in the heavenly realms, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine, and I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Today my mind is alert. My spirit is receptive. As I'm taught the Word of God, my life is being changed for the better, and I'll never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. I believe all of us as believing men, you understand we're in a mixed congregation tonight, but it's a men's conference kicked off tonight. All of us as believing men are men of destiny. Now, you ladies, you can believe you're a lady of destiny, but you understand i got to speak to what I'm addressing. But we have to see that revelation and act upon that revelation in order for our destiny to come to pass. Now, all you guys say this out loud. All of us, as believing men, are men of destiny. But I have to see that revelation and act upon that revelation in order for my destiny to come to pass. Let's go to Genesis 28. I, this evening I want to talk to you about the connected man. The connected man. Genesis 28, beginning in verse 20. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tent. Sue and I have been on that kind of a pilgrimage. When I was uh, 17, I graduated from high school, and I went to a state school, Miami University in, in Oxford, Ohio. And during that freshman year of college, uh, Sue and I got involved in lay ministries. Uh, we, we weren't called into the ministry at that point. We had no aspirations to be in the ministry, but we were going to a great church, and we wanted to be a help, so we were involved in various lay ministries. But it was during that freshman year, one day in prayer and mor morning devotional, that the Lord called me into the ministry, and I submitted to that call. And I told my father uh, that uh, when that freshman year was over, I told him I was not going back, that I was going to go to Bible school instead. And he took me to lunch and tried to talk me out of it. I could take you to the place. There's a little used car lot there now, but it used to be a restaurant, hamburger joint called Jerry's. And uh, he told me how disappointed he was and uh, he had always promised to pay for my college education at the college of my choice. But he told me that he was not going to pay for that. And he told me that he was going to cut me off. He was going to write me out of his will. And uh, then he began to prophesy over my life. He told me that I'd be poor all the days of my life, that I'd have nothing, that I'd be nothing, that I'd not go anywhere. But I crossed the faith line. At that time, I didn't know a whole lot, but I believed that I could accomplish more with God than I could ever accomplish making man happy. Well, we went to Bible school, and uh, I didn't have anybody paying for my education, so I had bills. I had tuition bills. I had book bills. I had room and board bills. I was dating Pastor Sue, and that was a lot of bills. <laughs> and uh, so I sold cookware. And it was the best thing that ever happened because I made money when I sold. When I didn't sell, I didn't make money. And I was an only child. I was not all that outgoing. And I got over it, though, because if I, if I wasn't outgoing, if I didn't meet people, I didn't sell. If I didn't sell, I didn't make money. And so I learned, I learned actually more about the ministry selling cookware than I learned in Bible school about the ministry. Well, I graduated from college in three years at the age of 20. And uh, Sue and I got married. And when we got married, we headed out for Texas so I could attend seminary in Fort Worth. And all we had was $400 that Sue's grandfather gave us. You know, I'd made money selling cookware, made, made a lot of money. I was, I was rated uh, 17th worldwide one month, made a lot of money. But I had a lot of bills. And I was paying my own freight, and I had to pay for Sue's wedding ring and other expenses. And so when we actually, and the honeymoon, and when we actually got in the car and headed off for Texas, we had $400 that Sue's grandpa had given us. So we've been on a journey. We've been on a faith pilgrimage but even though we only started out with $400, it 
in 27 years of marriage, Sue and I have given more than $730,000 personally into the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you know that's a lot of headway Amen. from $400? Now, I didn't say we lived on $730,000. I said we gave more than $730,000 personally into the gospel. Since pioneering this ministry 20 years ago, we've given over $6.8 million into the gospel. And I know I may look like a white man, but I have many nations on the inside of me. I pastor a blessed church. Every Sunday we have 36 nations, and those are the ones we know about from every corner of the world, people, many immigrants. And I love pastoring immigrants because if you just pastored native-born Americans, it would skew your perspective because they want to whine and cry and tell you how they can't make it. But I also pastor a whole lot of immigrants and people who have come to America with nothing and uh, they don't have the advantages we have. They might have a thick accent, but you know what they do? They go to work. And they just believe that uh, they can go to work and they can save money and they can make it. And the same week I'll have some white guy crying, Pastor, pray for me. I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't find a job. I'll have an immigrant call the office, say, Pastor, will you and Pastor Sue come and pray over our home? And here a couple of years back, we had that exact situation happen in, in the span of seven days. And this uh, wonderful couple from Africa, two different countries in Africa, met here in the United States. They said, now, Pastor, don't be disappointed. It's, it's our starter home. You know, my wife and I, we're just immigrants from Africa. Uh, it's our starter home. And uh, I'd been trying to encourage, you know, some white guy couldn't make it. And then we go over there to pray for this, the home of these immigrants. And I thought, man, I, this is some kind of starter home. It was a five-bedroom brick custom house. I thought, yeah, yeah, that's my kind of starter home. Now, you know, the land doesn't care who the farmer is. If somebody went out here and bought a piece of ground, the land doesn't care whether the farmer's white, black, tall, short, male, or female. And that is the way the Word of God is. You see, the Word of God has absolutely no regard for your race or your color or your gender. The Word of God is like a field. And the Word of God doesn't care who is plowing the field. Amen. So we pastor a church and we're experiencing overflowing prosperity. In fact, uh, we, are, uh, we are experiencing prosperity at a level that I'm sure some would consider obscene. Uh, two years ago, Father's Day of 2002... Uh, Sue and I had been on vacation with the kids for three weeks. We came back, and I had, I had guys, it was apparent they had missed me. I should go on vacation more often. And they said, Pastor, we didn't know when you were ever coming back. And uh, when I, I preached that Sunday on Father's Day 2002, and I was walking out the door, and one of the ushers approached me, and he said, Pastor, we missed you, and here's a card from some of us. I didn't think anything about it, put it in my briefcase, went to lunch. When I got home, I opened it up, and it was a nice card from the ushers. And uh, saying, you know, how much they appreciated me and calling me, thanking me for being their spiritual father. And in there was a certified check for $16,000. Now, how many of you know a certified check is a good check? Yeah. You don't have to worry about, now, is this going to make it through the system or not? <laughs> and this past uh, Palm Sunday, you know, I rode a Harley Davidson in here. That was the second ride and uh, gave that Harley-Davidson into the ministry for the building project. And uh, about a week later, Sue and I were having lunch, sitting at the house having lunch. I think it was a Friday, which is my study day. We were at the house having lunch, and I hear this vroom, vroom, uh, pulling up in the driveway. And four men were there from the congregation, and uh, they had gone to the place where the church had liquidated that bike, and they had redeemed it and uh, $20,000 and brought it back and gave it back to me. So we are experiencing an obnoxious level <laughs> of prosperity. Amen. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. If God will be with me. You see, there is a place in God where you can walk with the hand of God Almighty upon your life. 
And I'm here to testify that if God Almighty has got His hand upon your life, then there's absolutely nothing the devil can do about it. There's nothing that office politics can do about it. There's nothing that man can do about it. If God puts His hand of blessing, abundance, and prosperity upon your life, you are going to pull ahead, you are going to be a success in life, and you are going to prosper. In 1991, we experienced our first wealth transfer. We'd been looking and looking for a house. Uh, we were out of space, out of closet space, and uh, we wanted a house that had a... The primary thing was we wanted a house that had a, a bathroom for every bedroom. And then also, my son came up with a brilliant idea once. He said, I want to walk out my back door and be able to go fishing. And I wanted to say, you know, shut your mouth, because in the state of Texas, that's expensive. And, but he held fast, and we, didn't have, we couldn't get him to agree with us, so we had to get an agreement with him. And uh, one day I was playing golf on a golf course in Fort Worth, and I looked across this little pond or uh, small lake. There was a house backed up to it. And I said to the Lord, I said to the Lord, I said, like that, Father, like that, but in Arlington. And in, in a moment, it, it wasn't a vision, but I saw, I saw my car driving up a particular street in the city of Arlington. And I heard God's voice say, go there. Well, I, uh, I quit early and uh, got in my car, and I drove over there to that street. I knew the street, and I knew the house because Sue and I had watched the house be built, but it, it had never had a sign in front of it. And so obviously somebody was building it for themselves. Well, on this day, it had a sign in front of it. And so we had our realtor check it out, come to find out that a bank executive with Nations Bank had built it for himself, and toward the end of construction, he'd been transferred. Well, he listed it, tried to sell it, couldn't sell it. Uh, Nations Bank bought it. They listed it, tried to, they reduced the price, listed it, tried to sell it. They couldn't sell it. And they had reduced the price again and had just relisted it, and that's when we saw it. And so we, uh, we made arrangements. We got in there. We looked at it. And I had the realtor make them a ridiculous offer. Well, the bank came back $5,000 over ridiculous, and so we bought it. And uh, we bought it $150,000 light. And for the first time in our lives, I began to see that God is a God of supernatural wealth transfers. And I saw for the first time in my life that God could get more money into my hand in a moment, sitting at a table then I could put aside in my accounts in five or ten years of saving money. You see, I believe that about you. I believe God can do more for you in a day or a week or a month than you could do for yourself in five or ten or even twenty years. Earlier in the service, I mentioned how it's important to keep giving. You may have given to God and you're waiting on your harvest, but you've got to keep giving. In the fall of 1993, we had a challenge offering. And in those days, we were raising money to go on television. We went on television on our anniversary, August 7, 1994, and this was the challenge offering in the fall of 93. And the Lord spoke to me going into that challenge offering. I, I had saved and saved and saved, and I'd bought my first Harley Davidson. And uh, the Lord told me to, to give that into the offering. Well, I didn't write it in on that occasion. I liquidated the bike for $15,000, and I brought that $15,000, and I gave it into the Fall Challenge offering in October of 1993. You understand, offerings are above and beyond the tithe. The tithe turns the ignition on, but offerings are what mash the accelerator. Well, within 60 days, Sue and I experienced a 60-fold return. Now, it didn't have anything to do with the ministry, but it was a harvest, and it was a, it was a harvest from God. And you know when I say $15,000, 60-fold return, some people don't know a whole lot about math, so I'll just tell you, well, that was $900,000. And so soon I became millionaires at the age of 37. Now, I know some people are just dumbfounded that a minister would admit he's a millionaire. Well, why would you go out and pick a loser for a pastor? You know, Christians are so funny. Christians are so funny. You would never call up Merrill Lynch or some stock brokerage outfit and say, now I want the worst losingest stockbroker you got to handle my accounts. Uh, you would not call up Paris Hospital and say, now which surgeon has killed the most people in the last 10 years? I know they need practice, so I want them to work on me. 
you might have them work on your mother-in-law, but you would not have them work you would not have them work on you. You would not call the Board of Realty here in Arlington and say, now, now, which real estate agent has sold the least real estate in the last 12 months? Because I know they need help, and I want to help them. I want them to list my house. No, Christians are so funny. It's only when they pick a preacher that they will go out and search out and seek out a loser. Well, Dr. Loser doesn't pastor here. And then, of course, in the great bull market of the 90s, I made more than a million dollars for my family. And uh, the Lord spoke to me, and I sold all those equities in April of 2000, so I missed the whole downturn. But then Sue and I were on vacation in August of 2000 with friends in Paris and London. And on the cruise ship back from Southampton to New York City, I said to my friends sitting on the, the deck of that ship, I said, you know, a million dollars is not enough. The same God who made me a millionaire is the same God who can make me a multimillionaire. Now, tonight I'm dealing with confession. Amen. I'm dealing with labor. I'm dealing with connections. I'm dealing with partnerships. And I'm speaking to you about the connected man. I'll tell you, I'll tell you where you are. Because I pastor this congregation. See, a lot of people came here with nothing. And God brought you out of nothing and now you own a house, and now you have two cars, and you're making the car payments, and you, you're making the house payment, and now you're comfortable. See, when you came here, you were hungry because you were broke. But you lost. Many of you have lost that eye of the tiger because you're satisfied. But I submit to you, the same God that brought you from nothing into the ranks of the middle class is now the same God who wants to pick you up out of the ranks of the middle class and carry you into the ranks of the wealthy. Amen. Are you hearing me tonight? Amen. I said the same God that picked you up from when you had nothing and brought you into the ranks of the middle class is the same God that wants to pick you up now in the ranks of the middle class and carry you on into the ranks of the wealthy. Amen. Now... I said that to my friend on that cruise ship, and inside of 60 days of that confession coming out of my mouth, as Sue and I were driving down an interstate in Colorado, I had an idea. Tell your neighbor, God gave him another idea. That was October of 2000. I acted on that idea and experienced a $600,000 wealth transfer of the wicked into my hands in December of 2000, and I became a multimillionaire at the age of 44. I'm talking about harvest. I'm talking about plunder. I'm talking about the reality of the Word of God. The reality of the 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold return. I'm talking about the reality of walking in covenant with God Most High like Jacob did. I'm talking about the reality of daring to believe God. That if you'll give God His tithe, if you'll walk with God in financial covenant, if you'll listen to His voice when He gives you ideas, if you'll follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, He will never, ever, ever lead you into the ditch, but He will lead you into the fat place. Amen. And we don't hide anything. Amen. We realized a long time ago that we live in a glass house, so there's no point in hiding anything. In July of 2001, I stood up and announced to the congregation on a Sunday morning in all three services that I'd purchased a new Saturday car, a Ferrari 360 Modena Spider, and I also announced that I didn't have any debt on it. No point in hiding anything. They're all going to find it out anyway. And to show you how little stuff means to me, I liquidated that car in the fall of 2002, and I gave the $27,000 profit into the building fund of this church. You see, the same God that brought the first one, he's the same God that will bring another one. We don't have to fall in love with stuff. So we don't act poor. Hate to disillusion you. We don't talk poor. I'm not trying to act like your last pastor. I drive a Mercedes AMG S600. Well, why do you drive that? It's the most expensive one they had. My father-in-law, you know, he thinks I don't know anything. He said, well, you know, you could have drove some of the others. Maybe, did you test drive this, test drive that? And I was just trying to give him a hard time. I said, well, no, I didn't test drive. I just told him I wanted the most expensive one they had. Just to drive him nuts. Amen. <laughs> Pastor Sue drives a Jaguar XJR100, one of only 250 imported. She likes Jaguar. My Saturday car now is a BMW Z8, one of only 1,200 ever imported. And we, all, we purchased them all new. Tell your neighbor, they build this stuff new. 
so I am a successful man. I got that anointing on me. There are many preachers who have successfully taught God's people to be poor, and they're having to live with the fruit of their teaching. I have successfully taught God's people to be successful, to prosper and to abound, and I'm living with the fruit of my teaching. It seems like a very equitable arrangement to me. But let me tell you something about you. You didn't come here tonight to hear about me. You came here tonight to hear about you. Let me tell you something about you. You are here this evening because you want to be a, a success in life. You're here tonight because you want to be successful. That is why you have sought out Pastors Gene and Sue Lingerfeld. That is why you are here this evening. The very fact that you are here tells me a whole lot about you. You're not a loser. You have dreams. You have goals. You have aspirations for this life as well as for the next. You're an overcomer. You're a winner. You're an achiever. You're not a moocher. You're a producer. Now tonight I'm talking about confession. I'm talking about labor. I'm talking about connections. I'm talking about partnerships. I'm talking to you tonight about the connected man. You see, God blesses his people through their labor. And God blesses his people through their connections. Now you can get connected to the wrong thing or you can get connected to the right thing. You can get connected to a drug dealer or a low-life boyfriend, or someone who has no integrity of biz in business, or a loser preacher, and that's the wrong thing. But you can get connected to the right thing. You can get connected to success. You can get connected to the anointing of God. You can get connected to the, to the anointing that God has for abundance and prosperity. And that anointing is on us. That anointing which is upon us is obvious. It is evident. Its evidence is everywhere. I stand tonight preaching the gospel in a debt-free church. You see, my life is blessed because at the age of five, my mother took me to Bethesda Missionary Temple in Detroit, Michigan. The first thing I remember them teaching me was how Jesus, how God gave his only begotten son, Jesus, to die as a ransom for me. How he gave his life, his all, his best for me. And there at the age of five in Sunday school, I heard the gospel story and I fell in love with Jesus and I've loved him ever since. The next thing I remember them teaching me is they put an offering envelope into my hand. It was a small offering envelope they used for Sunday school, and they taught me about tithing. In those days, my allowance when you know, I was five or six was uh, a nickel a week, I, uh, a quarter a week. I didn't know how to tithe on a quarter a week, so I gave God a nickel every Sunday. And that's why I'm blessed. I've tithed since I was five years old. They taught me that one-tenth of everything that crossed my hand belonged to God. It didn't belong to me. It wasn't even mine to give. It was God's. And I paid it to God as a tithe. It was God's. It belonged to God. And so I've been tithing since I was five years old. You see, people want to judge what you got, but they don't want to do what you did to get what you got. And I know I've heard these various adjectives used about me. But I will be D-A-M-N-E-D if I will let a thief judge me. And I've never one time met a critic who was a tither. You may as well get somebody out of Huntsville to criticize me and expect me to pay attention to it. Well, I don't like that message. That's because you're a thief and a robber. Ain't no non-tither going to heaven. Now, is this a men's conference or is this a little boy's conference? You know, you want to know why Christians are broke? They're not faithful. God can't trust them. Amen. You don't tithe, you're going to spend your whole life at Walmart. Amen. 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 Well, I've been standing in line down at Walmart. You know, women get such a bum rap on shopping. I think it was two Christmases ago, so, or no, it wasn't two Christmases ago. It was sometime. I forgot what I was doing, but anyway, it was Christmas. Two Christmases ago, Christina was with me, and we walk into the Neiman Marcus store up at Willow Bend, and uh, we, I park over at a certain place, and uh, walking through the uh, men's department, 
and uh, Christine is with me. She's going to help me shop for her mother. And a man greeted me, said, good morning, Dr. Lingerfeld. And my daughter said, what's up with this? She said, I don't know how many times I've been to Neiman Marcus with mom, and they never call her by name. <laughs> But at Walmart, they never knew me. <laughs> they said, away from me, we never knew you. <laughs> Got no frequent flyer card at Walmart. <laughs> Psalm 1, blessed is the man. How many of you want to be that blessed man? Yeah. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. And notice it does not say that he's going to bring forth his neighbor's fruit. See, your job is not to come to church to make money. Your job is to go out into the world and make money and then come to church and bring money to the house of God. Amen. We don't come to church to make money. We come to church to worship God and to worship God with our money, with our tithes and offerings. And besides, people who do come to church to make money don't really come to church to make money. No, they come to church to mooch money. And that is exactly why I'm preaching this message because I do not stand here tonight in front of a bunch of losers and moochers. Amen. No, I stand here tonight in front of a bunch of winners, in front of a bunch of overcomers, in front of a bunch of achievers, in front of a bunch of producers. Amen. Say it out loud, I'm not a moocher. I'm a, I'm, a I'm a producer. And I've come down here tonight to tell you unapologetically that in 2004 you have walked into your season. You heard in the video I said you're sitting in it. Amen. And I'm telling you tonight that you have come into your season. You have just now walked into your fruit-bearing season. Amen. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Say it out loud. Whatever I do, whatever I prospers. Do, prospers. Prosper. Whatever I put my hand to, whatever prospers. See, you have to have confidence in God, and you may have confidence in me, but you've got to develop confidence in you. So when you make that confession, lift up your own hands and say, whatever I do prospers. Whatever I put my hand to prospers. Somebody might say, well, how can you say that? Well, I know you're a winner. And how do I know you're a winner? Because you sought us out. You sought out pastors Gene and Sue Lingerfeld. You didn't seek out Dr. Loser. No, you sought us out. You sought us out. You sought out a strong word. You had your choice of all of those weak words, but you sought out a strong word. So that tells me all I need to know about you. Amen. Amen. You got the eye. You got the look, brother. Amen. Amen. You're hungry. Amen. You're ready. So that tells me a whole lot about where you're headed. You're not headed for the ditch. You're not headed for the gutter. You're not even headed for the status quo. Just having more of the same like you've always had. No, you're on the upward incline. You are right now headed upward and onward. I know this about you because you've sought us out. Look at Deuteronomy 8.18. Deuteronomy 8.18. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth. And so confirms His covenant, which He swore to your forefathers as it is today. So we're talking about a covenant. Remember God, because it is God who gives you the ability to produce wealth. The King James says it is God who gives you the power to get wealth. Some of God's people today have one of two problems. Some of God's people are moochers, and some of God's people are seed corn eaters. Say this out loud. I'm not a moocher. I'm, not a moocher. I'm a producer. I'm, a producer. I'm, not a I'm not a beggar. I'm a dominion taker. I'm a dominion. Whatever I put my hand to Whatever. prospers. Prosper. Not only that, Prosper. it is the will of God will that I prosper, prosper in this life. God has a plan for me to prosper. So I'm going to work God's plan. And I'm going to prosper like never before. Well, pastor, what's a moocher? A moocher is somebody that's trying to make a living off their brother. They're the kind that come to church and they're selling this and selling that. Or they're trying to do some multi-level deal in God's house. They're moochers. Amen. 
By the way, if I don't, if I don't offend you in the message, if you'll come up to me after the service, I'll do my best to personally offend you. <laughs> don't look at me in that tone of voice. 20 years. See, I didn't just fall off the last truck. I don't know how many I've met. And they would come in and do a multi-level deal, come in and sell a bunch of this junk and a bunch of that junk to the people of God and give $10, $25, $50 a week and act like they were a big deal. I'm telling you, they're moochers. Pastor, are you saying there are a lot of Christians today in the body of Christ who are moochers? Absolutely. In fact, there are a bunch of preachers out there who are moochers. We had one preacher come in for a special meeting one night, guest, a guest, preacher, and hand one of our, signa, our singers his business card. Now, if that's, not a, if that's not a mooch, I don't know what a mooch is. I mean, it'd be a sad thing to be in the ministry and not have confidence you could generate uh, a singer with your own anointing. You could generate a, a musical group with your own anointing, not have confidence you could generate uh, a good worship program with your own anointing and have to go down and, and mooch off Dr. Lingerfeld. They can't even generate with their own ministry. So they have to come mooch off another man's ministry. I've, I've never done that. I've been in this town 20 years, and I've produced so much, I've filled this church three times and several other churches in the meantime. That's how much I produce. <laughs> I produce enough. How much do you produce, Pastor? <laughs> I produce so much, I filled this place three times, and I don't even miss the ones that left me. <laughs> but some of them will be back as soon as we get in that new building. <laughs> We're going to hand them an offering envelope. You see, if I'm producing, I don't have to do any mooching. Say it out loud. If I'm producing, I'm producing. I don't have to do any mooching. And a lot of believers and a lot of preachers are doing nothing but mooching. They're not producers, they're moochers. See, your job is to go out into the world, see the world's wealth transferred into your hands, and then bring at least a tenth of everything that crosses your hands back to Cathedral of Praise. You see, the tithe is the starting place. The tithe is what turns the ignition of the covenant of prosperity on, but it's offerings that mash the accelerator. And too many of God's people are trying to use church to make money off their brothers. You don't come to church to get money. money. You come to church to worship God and to give money. And then you've got, you've got believers, church people, and they're, they're uh, moochers. And then you've got others that are seed corn eaters. What's a seed corn eater? See, God doesn't mind your being wealthy, but what God does mind is you're being selfish, consuming 100% of what you generate on yourself. My grandfather had a modest farm. It was 180 acres, and on that farm, he had four structures. He had the house he lived in, and all of this was built before refrigeration. And, uh, and uh, in the back, he had a barn. You understand, in the loft, he had hay, and down below, he had uh, a place where he could pull equipment in out of the weather, but he also had stalls for uh, cows at, at night when they would come in from the fields, and some horses he had when I was younger. And then... Uh, uh, just outside the back door, he had a smokehouse because that was built before refrigeration. And they would pack uh, pork and salt and, you know, smoke uh, meat. And then when you walked out the back door over to the left, he had what they called a corn crib. It was just a small barn, but it was set aside to store corn. Now, my grandfather, with a small farm, you understand, 180 acres, he couldn't compete with the gigantic agribusiness farms in Iowa, Nebraska, and Kansas and all that. So he grew specialty corn. And he would grow either popcorn or Indian corn. And every year he took the best of his crop and he set it aside in that corn crib. And no matter what happened, he would never, not ever under any circumstances, eat that corn or sell that corn because what was stored in the corn crib was his future. See, that was next year's living. That was next year's livelihood. See, if he had eaten that seed corn or sold that seed corn, he might have had a short-term benefit, but he would have sabotaged his own future. And the only problem was, all it was was a, a barn, small barn, where this seed corn was stored, and the problem was rats got, would get in there. Well, when I was a boy, I had a rifle, and I needed the target practice, and my grandmother wanted to get rid of the rats. And so whenever I was visiting, 
she would give me 10 cents a rat tail. <laughs> Pay me, not give me. And so I'd go out there in the corn crib, and, uh, you know, I, I, there were no lights, and I had a flashlight, and I'd look here and look there, bang, and I'd get that one in, bang, I'd get that one in, and then I'd cut off their tails, and I'd bring them in, and I'd collect my, collect my money from my grandma. See, even when I was a boy, I was a producer. <laughs> But you know, it's one thing for a rat to get into your barn and eat your seed corn, but it's another thing entirely for you to be foolish enough to eat your own seed corn. And that is exactly what your tithe is. Your tithe is your seed corn. Your tithe is your future. Last time I was in Africa, I asked them, if God gave you 10 coconuts, would you eat all 10? Or would you at least set one aside to plant in the sand? Because if you eat all 10, that's it, you enjoy them, you eat all 10, you enjoy all 10, but those 10 coconuts are gone forever. But what would happen if you took at least one coconut, set it aside, and planted it in the sand? It's going to take some time, but if you set aside one of those coconuts and plant it in the sand, you're going to have coconuts every year forever. I also asked them, would you rather have a chicken today or an egg tomorrow? Because a lot of believers I've met, if you gave them a chicken, they'd slaughter it, they'd eat it. They wouldn't even save any for tomorrow. They'd eat the whole thing today. But see, if you, if you don't eat the chicken today, you're going to have eggs from now on every morning for quite some time. Amen. Your tithe is your seed corn. Don't eat your seed corn. Too many of God's people have been eating their seed corn. They've been vacationing on their seed corn. They even bought a new car on their seed corn. Your tithe is your seed corn. Too many of God's people have been living on God's tithe. They have been enjoying things that I had to do without. So you ought not judge me or be envious of me because I'm blessed. Maybe you're here tonight, you're checking out the ministry, it's friend day, and how I'm preaching a message like this on friend day night, I still have to, I can only blame me for the calendar. It's just too much, it's just too much. But what are we going to do? We're in the middle of the sermon. But you, you, you ought not judge me because, in fact, you ought to feel sorry for me. Every time you think about me, you ought to think, oh, poor pastors, Gene and Sue. Why? Well, because since I was five years old, I tithe. I didn't just start tithing last week. I mean, I remember back when Sue and I, uh, when we got married, we were so broke, we had a $10 a week grocery budget, and we were tithing. Even that, that one year, we realized, well, we couldn't survive on that. I mean, we were looking thin and young and beautiful, but you know what? I mean, enough's enough. And so we went for a gigantic 50% increase in our grocery budget. We went from $10 to $15. But you know what? Even in those days, we were tithing. See, when those lean days, when we were... We, it was a sacrifice to pay that tithe. We were having to live on 10% less. And people around us were eating 100% of what they were producing. They were vacationing on the tithe. They were buying cars on the tithe. They were eating out on the tithe. But today, they're still struggling. And Pastor Sue and I aren't struggling. In Genesis 12, God spoke to a man named Abraham and called him out. In a day when there was no Bible, God revealed himself to that man Abraham. And God told Abraham to leave his land, his home and his family, and to learn to walk in financial covenant with God. God wanted Abraham to learn how to be independent. God wanted Abraham to learn how to walk independently in financial covenant with God Most High. You see, our culture is a culture of dependence. People are dependent on Valium. They're dependent on Prozac. They're dependent on welfare. They're dependent on Section 8. They're dependent on food stamps. They're dependent on debt. And now they're even dependent on Viagra. <laughs> but when you come into the word of faith, God wants you to learn how to be independent, to stop being dependent and learn how to be independent. God wants you to learn how to walk independently in financial covenant with God Most High. God wanted Abraham to walk independently in financial covenant with him, with God Most High. So Abraham headed out. His only mistake was that he took his nephew Lot with him, and God never spoke to Abraham again until he parted company with Lot. At first, Lot pitched his tent toward Sodom. But then when you get to Genesis 14, he's not toward Sodom, he's living in Sodom. And in those days, in Genesis 14, there's a story of nine kings. Don't have time to read it. But there were uh, five lesser kings, and they were paying tribute to four greater kings. But there came a point where they got tired of paying duty to the, or, or privilege or tribute to the four uh, less, greater kings. And so the five kings decided they were going to rebel. And one of the five lesser kings was the king of Sodom. 
And so they, they rebelled and they stopped paying tribute. Well, the five lesser kings were attacked by the four greater kings. And they came through and they took all the people. They took all the gold. They took all the donkeys. They took all the sheep. They took all the silver. They took all the people. They came through like locusts and they took everything. And you see, in those days, God, uh, Abraham was connected to God, but Lot was connected to Sodom. So Lot was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And because Lot was in the wrong place at the wrong time, he suffered loss for it. I'm talking about the connected man. See, Abraham was not affected by this war because Abraham was connected to God. But Lot was affected by the war because Lot was connected to Sodom. Hence, Lot was in the wrong place at the wrong time. You want to know why bad stuff happens? Because people get connected to the wrong thing. They get connected to the wrong boyfriend. They get connected to the wrong girlfriend. They get connected to the drug dealer. Or get, they get connected to some vow of, potter, vow of poverty pedophile preacher. So bad stuff happens to people when they get connected to the wrong thing. But good stuff happens to people when they get connected to the right thing. Look there in a few verses in Genesis 14, beginning in verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Then Abram gave him a tenth of everything. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord God Most High creator of heaven and earth, and have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say I made Abram rich. So Abraham refused to receive anything from the king of Sodom. That is the government of his day. Why? Because he was walking independently in financial covenant with God Most High. See, a lot of people have never figured this out, that if you can get God to go to work with you, you're automatically going to be more blessed. But pastor, how do I get God to go with me? Look at Genesis 15, 1 after this. After, what, after Abraham had renewed his financial covenant with God by giving God a tenth of everything that had crossed his hand. After this, after tithing the tithe. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. So God is our reward. See, other people mooch. They put their faith in mooching. Other people are seed corn eaters. They consume everything that they generate. But we are not like that. We put our hope in God. We put our faith in God because God has declared to us that he is our very great reward. And contrary to what People may be preaching out here. He is not a little reward. He is not a little bit of a reward. He is a very great reward. Why then? Why then is it so unusual? I told you in the brochure that if you would come, I would tell you, I would do my best to give you the principles by which we have lived that have enabled us to start broke and poor at 20 with $400 and come to this place. Because as long as it's unique or unusual in my life, they're all going to say, well, it's because he's a preacher. But I say nonsense. And I believe I've got the anointing on me to generate this over and over and over and over and to replicate the blessing and to replicate the anointing because the power is not in my life. The power is in the Word of God. The anointing is in the Word of God. We have come where we are today. We are living a blessed life today because of what we have been doing all of these 27 years of marriage. So you don't have any right to judge where we are until you put in 27 years like what we've put in or you've tithed 43 years like I've tithed 43 years. But I'm putting myself at risk here because it's exactly this kind of message that people will go out of here and judge me on. But you know what? I told you my intentions at the very front. I don't need to hang on to everybody that passes through these doors because I know that I've got an anointing on my life and if you'll just hang around a while, I'll talk you into it and I'm going to lay my hands on you and I'm going to prophesy over your life and I'm going to speak the word of life and I'm going to speak the word of faith into you and I'm going to talk you into the blessing of Almighty God I'll generate it in you. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There will come a time I will stand and speak to 200 millionaires. Yeah. 
And all the preachers in America will want to come just so they can get an honorarium. Why did Melchizedek receive the tithe? Melchizedek's function was to remind Abraham, Abraham, you are blessed by God. That's what I'm doing. And Melchizedek's function was to remind Abraham that the victory he had won and the plunder he had taken was because of God. It wasn't Abraham, it was God. And that's what the tithe is. It's an acknowledgement that my success is due to my covenant with God. You never one time in this message heard me tell you how smart I am. But I'm bragging on God. I got here through God. I got here walking in covenant with God. But I haven't been playing with it. See, you're here. There are people here tonight, and I know you got the eye. Man, you got the look. Man, you're ready. You're hungry. You're aggressive. But there are folks here tonight, and you're playing with it. And you know what? You just keep playing with it, and just keep playing with it, and just keep playing with it. And 10 years hence, you're going to be exactly where you are tonight. But I'm telling you, man, if you'll buckle in, If you'll get connected, I'm talking about, I'm doing my best to preach to you tonight about the connected man. If you'll get connected, not to the wrong thing, but to the right thing, 10 years hence, you will not even be able to believe it yourself. And that's what the tithe is. It's an acknowledgement that my success is due to my covenant with God. And when you keep that tithe, you are denying that God has a hand in your life. When you keep that tithe, you are declaring that you are not in covenant with God. When you come here to Cathedral of Praise, the role of Melchizedek is exactly the role that pastors Gene and Selingerfeld play in your life. We are here to remind you that you are blessed by God. You saw in that video over and over and over. All during these 20 years is what I've been doing, reminding you that you are blessed by God, that your life is blessed by God, that your labor is blessed by God. And we're also here to remind you that what you have done so far and what you will do, you do not because you're so bright, not because you're so wonderful, not because you're so intelligent. Man, you get on that high horse, you are headed for a fall but reminding you that you have what you have and you're doing what you're doing because you have the blessing of God most high upon your life. Abraham did not walk the earth as other men did. He walked the earth as a covenant man. This is how God gets money into his kingdom. God gets money into his kingdom by blessing the labor of his people, not by mooching. I mean, if everybody in church comes on a Sunday morning, three services Sunday morning, and everybody's mooching off of each other, well, where's the new money coming from? No, our job is to go out into the world. I sat there in December of 2000 across the table from a man, and he was giving it up, and I was reaping it. And I was tempted to feel sorry for him, but then I told my wife, well, he can get saved if he wants to get saved. The wealth of the wicked stored up for the righteous. I signed my name, and my net worth jumped $600,000. I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. I said, I know what I'm talking about. I have men here tonight who gave more into this ministry last year than they made the year they came to this church. Now, some people would say that's nuts. And if you're silly enough to tell your relatives, I assure you they'll tell you it's nuts. That's why you don't tell your business, especially not to relatives. I would say it's not nuts. I would say it's only possible because they're making at least 10 times what they were making the year they came to Pastors Gene and Sue Lingerfeld. 10 times? That's not your ability. 10 times? That's not your education. 10 times? That's not your intelligence. 10 times? That's the anointing of God. Abraham did not walk the earth as other men did, and we do not walk the earth as other men do. Abraham walked the earth as a covenant man, and this is how God gets money into his gospel and into his kingdom, by blessing his people. So we're not preaching sacrifice. We're we're preaching abundance. The best news you could possibly hear is that Pastor Lingerfeld has need of an extra million dollars. Why? Because all that means is God's got to run an extra $10 million through the hands of his people here at Cathedral of Praise. You see, needs in the body of Christ are God's way of allowing his people to become wealthy. God doesn't have to allow a need in his house. Do you get it? God does not have to allow a need in his house. So why are there sometimes needs in God's house? Because God God is challenging us, and God is testing us to see if we're ready, if we're qualified to go on to the next level. 
Men will become millionaires off of this building project. Men will become multi-millionaires off of this building project. And there'll be men, and they'll become millionaires off of this building project. They'll become multi-millionaires off of this building project. And 10 years hence, there'll be some folks, and they'll still be exactly where they are tonight. The choice is up to you. But I'm doing everything in my power. I'm doing everything in my power to get the word to you and to talk you into it. Man, you got to break out. You got to break out. You got to stop thinking inside the box. And you've got to begin to believe in yourself that I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. So here in this ministry, we literally have families becoming wealthy, men becoming millionaires. And ladies, you can get in on that too. Off of our ministry and our anointing, we have that same anointing on us, the same anointing Melchizedek had. You can see it in us when you talk to us. You can see excellence in everything we do. We have that anointing upon us for wealth creation. And if you can see it, you can literally get wealthy by connecting to this ministry and partnering yourself together with pastors Gene and Sue Lingerfeld. I'm talking about the connected man. But you can't be running around town like some six-year-old girl with your feelings hurt. Yeah. He hurt my feelings. Move on, brother. You won't do us any good. Amen. Amen. But give me some felons. Give me some people on parole out of Huntsville. Give me some folks, amen, just came through bankruptcy court. And I'll build something out of them. Amen. 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 Abraham and Melchizedek were connected. They were partners. You saw that in that video. See, I was partnered together with Bud Sickler. I was partnered together with Lester Summerall. I was partnered together with Kenneth Hagin. See, that's where the power comes from. And God blessed Abraham's labor. Abraham dug wells. That was labor. And Abraham had herds of sheep and goats. That was labor. And we know that Isaac planted crops, and for Isaac, that was labor. But on this occasion, Abraham's labor was warfare. And by this labor, Abraham experienced a wealth transfer of the wicked into his hands. All the plundered goods of the four kings now came to Abraham. The wealth of the wicked stored up for the righteous. And Abraham gave God a tenth of everything through God's men, Melchizedek. So when you give your tithe to God, you're acknowledging that it is God who gives you the ability to produce wealth, the power to get wealth. Abraham, Abraham was empowered to go out and win because he knew that his God was with him. But how do you get God to go with you? You have to walk in financial covenant with God. You have to give God his tenth, his tithe. Abraham was not afraid. He did not walk the earth as other men did, and neither do you. You know, we have a young minister, a young evangelist out of this church uh, Terrell Glaze, and you can't be around Terrell for five minutes without him saying, the same anointing that is upon my pastors, pastors Gene and Sue Lingerfeld, is on my life as well. And only in the fifth year of ministry full-time, he experienced a $73,000 wealth transfer into his ministry. Now, to a lot of people, that's not a lot of money, but for the fifth year in ministry, $73,000 was a boatload of, of money. I wish to God I'd had a $73,000 wealth transfer in the fifth year of this ministry. You can make that same confession about your pastors. As you go to work tomorrow, you can say that same anointing that is on my pastors, Pastor Gene and Sue Lingerfeld, is on my life as well. You see, you partner together with God. You partner together with the Lingerfelds when you give your tithe to God here at Cathedral of Praise. Abraham was partnered together with Melchizedek, priest of God Most High. You see, God doesn't mind his people being wealthy if it furthers his vision, his dream, and his goals. But God does not want any to perish. He wants all men to come to a saving knowledge of his son. And all God has to do to produce wealth is to touch your life, touch your labor, and you will prosper supernaturally. And every Muslim in town will wonder what in the world has happened to you as you blow past them financially. Isaiah 119 says, if you are willing and obedient, you will eat the best from the land. If it's the will of God that I eat the best of the land, it must be the will of God that I wear the best of the land. If it's the will of God that I eat the best of the land, it must be God's will that I drive the best of the land. If it's the will of God that I eat the best of the land, it must be God's will that I live in the best of the land. And because it's God's will, that's exactly what I do. That's what we do around here. I eat the best, I wear the best, I drive the best, I live in the best, I marry the best, I birth the best. And if you don't want the best, then I'm not your pastor. Dr. Loser is down the road. But I know who I'm preaching to tonight. 
You're here because you want to win. You're here because you want to succeed. You're here because you want to prosper. You're here because you believe that the windows of heaven are opening up above your life in 2004 like they have never been opened above your life before. And you believe that your days of waiting have come to an end. And you believe that your days of harvest and reaping and supernatural plunder have now come upon you. And you believe that this is your time, this is your year, this is your hour, and this is your day. That's why you're here tonight. Let's wrap it up in Hebrews 6. Hebrews 6 verse 20. He, that is Jesus, has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 7, 1. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness. Then also king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, like the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now, are we in the New Testament or the Old Testament? We're in the New Testament. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi who become priests to collect a tenth from the people. That is their brothers, even though their brothers were descended from Abraham. This man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi. Yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by men who die. But in the other case, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham because because when Melchizedek met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. So Melchizedek was priest of God Most High. And Jesus has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. See, Jesus has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. What order is that? The order of blessing the tither. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Look at verse 6. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. Abraham's life was blessed because of his partnership with Melchizedek. I'm talking to you tonight about the connected man. Verse 7, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. Verse 8, in the one case, that is in the Old Testament case, the tenth is collected by men who die. But in the other case, that is the New Testament case, the tenth is collected by him who is declared to be living, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the lesser person, that's us, is blessed by the greater person, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. So here at Cathedral of Praise, you are connected to God through pastors Gene and Sue Lingerfeld. And when you bring your tithe, you're giving that tithe to the high priest of your faith, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And the lesser person, that is you, is blessed by the greater person, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you give that tithe, that tenth of everything that crosses your hand, Hands. Remember that you are really presenting that tithe to the high priest of your faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the lesser person, that is you, is blessed by the greater person, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Say it out loud. I'm not a moocher. I'm, not a moocher. I'm a producer. I'm, a I'm not a beggar. I'm, not a beggar. I'm, a I'm a dominion taker. Whatever I put my hand to Whatever. prospers. Not only that, it is the will of God that I prosper in this life. God has a plan for me to prosper. So I'm going to work God's plan and I'm going to prosper more than ever before. You know, the Lord challenged me. I, I was, uh, whenever it was, I think it was August, the Lord challenged me. He told me last year that my giving had gotten redundant, that I hadn't been stretching. And you know, if, if there's no stretch to it, there's no faith in it. And I felt like the Lord challenged me to give $100,000 in the fall challenge offering. And uh, so I committed to do that. In fact, on the first Sunday of uh, October when we had the challenge offering, I wrote a check. I didn't make payments. I didn't, you know, put a pledge in. I didn't uh, put a promise. I mean, I wrote a check for $100,000 and it cleared. I know it cleared because the institution called me to verify, did you really write this check? <laughs> oh, yes. I know which one you're calling about. It's the one for 100000 Yeah. Yeah, I wrote it. Oh, but don't pay any attention to me. What do I know? And then after I wrote that check, I got to wonder, and I, I told Pastor Sue, you know, I, I don't believe in going backwards. And I said, and so I, I looked it up. I wanted to make sure, you know, with that. I, I didn't know. I mean, I don't pay attention to such things. I try not to deal with uh, investments and such, such, such too much. It's so distracting. But I, I looked it up, and, and I told Pastor Sue later, I said, I was concerned that... Uh, you know, I mean, it's not that I wouldn't have given the 100000 but I mean, I'd be concerned to think that, that I took us backwards. I mean, I, I don't believe in going backwards. 
I hadn't even looked at it. I hadn't even paid attention. And I looked it up after I gave that $100,000, and uh, our net worth was up $350,000 for the year. Amen. Now, what kind of man can give $100,000 and still be up three fifty dollars for the year? A tithing man. A faith man. Oh, but don't pay any attention to me. What do I know about it? But I'm driving it. I'm wearing it. I'm living in it. I'm eating it. Eating a little too much of it. <laughs> and this message, you get on CD and you listen to it and you listen to it and you listen to it until you know what I'm going to say before I say it on that CD and you burn it into your conscious mind, you burn it into your subconscious mind, and you watch and see what God will do for you in 2004. Amen. 